today we're going to be discussing a, um, a, a theme in scripture, a theme. We have been doing in the past number of weeks, we've been doing a um, more of a verse by verse, working through a, a more lengthy passage. Today, however, we're going to look at a theme that I think is one of the connective themes that sort of joins all of scripture together. It's a really important um, subject. Uh, we're going to be talking about the theme of sacrifice. Sacrifice. It is at the heart of God. It is a part of his plan for us. And we even see this idea of sacrifice as far back as the Garden of Eden, where God covers Adam and Eve with the skins of animals. We see this in the sacrifice of Noah. We see this when God commands Abraham to sacrifice. We see this outside the Bible, even, uh, in ancient texts, clay texts that have been discovered by archaeologists. It talks about temples. It talks about worship. It talks about sacrifice to the gods. And so somewhere down inside of us, God has placed the reality of the importance of sacrifice. I think, however, that it's one that has fallen on hard times in the modern day. Sacrifice, in some measure, has become a, almost a bad word. And in, in place of that, we've put self-actualization, what's important to me, what, what pleases me. And I'm not so sure that that's been a real comfortable fit with the relationship that we have uh, with God through the scriptures, because it's so ingrained in the nature of God and the nature of the word. So today, we're going to turn to a study of this, and I hope that you'll bear with me again as we use a little bit of language that's not English, and that maybe you'll even learn a little bit through that. All right, today we're going to be talking about sacrifice as the centerpiece of scripture. Uh, we're going to be looking at this from a Jewish background's perspective because that's appropriate. This is where that's the world that our Bible comes from. So um, for um, all of my um, uh, Israeli friends who are join, joining in, Baruchim uh, Habayim, and excuse my poor pronunciation, but uh, you're just so welcome. Um, I'm thankful that there are people both in uh, class as well as around the world who join with us on a regular basis in the study of God's Word. So today we're talking about sacrifice the, um, and the general idea of sacrifice, and then we're going to be looking at some more specific aspects of sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus, sacrifice in the law of Moses, and sacrifice in the lives of followers of God like us. So what I would like to do is I'd like to first take a look at the life and death of Jesus as sacrifice. Um, sacrifice here is, uh, the sacrifice of Jesus is not an accident. It wasn't a, an historical glitch, but rather it was something that, um, that, 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 that happened that was a part of the plan of God, as the Bible says, from the foundation of the world. Um, to talk about the, the, the death of Jesus, we've actually got to talk about, um, we've got to go back to the book of Isaiah. Um, and in this Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22, you get these word pictures from these ancient people of God, and prophets of God in the Hebrew Bible that are so amazingly accurate that um, uh, it uh, actually is a picture of, of what happens in, at the end of all four of the Gospels, hundreds and hundreds of years before it ever happened. The prophet Isaiah says, surely our griefs he himself has borne, and our sorrows he has carried. Now, the Hebrew word there is nasa, and it's an important word because when you go to the book of Leviticus, or uh, Vayikra, you're talking about the Day of Atonement, and it's the same word, the goat that bears the sins of ancient Israel, and that is sent out from the camp, it says, will Nasa bear on itself 
all of their iniquities, all of their sins, chataim, um, and they will go to a solitary, it, it will go to a solitary land and be released and carry the sins of uh, the people of God away upon itself, that word nasa there. So what Isaiah is saying is he is describing the coming one who will bear the sins of the people out of the camp on himself. And the word is exactly the same, whether it's Isaiah 53 or it's Vaikra, the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, on the Day of Atonement. Isaiah continues, he was pierced for our transgressions. This is one who is suffering, one who is being sacrificed for our sins, verse 5. In verse 6, the Lord has, called the, has caused the iniquity of all of us to fall upon him. Again, uh, he is bearing, Nasa, he is bearing the sins of the people upon himself. In verses 7 and 8, we hear from the prophet Isaiah, like a lamb that is led to slaughter. Now we're hearing about the sacrificial victim. And Isaiah, again, is borrowing from the sacrificial system that was set up uh, through um, uh, Moses. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, he was cut off out of the land of the living. Now we're hearing about the death of the lamb, cut off out of the land of the living. Uh, for what reason? For the sin of my people, for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. God's people deserved the stroke of God's correction, but instead that fell upon the lamb that was led to slaughter. We're continuing in Isaiah 53, the Lord was pleased to crush him if he would render himself, this is voluntary sacrifice, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. Uh, verse 10, Continuing in verse 11, the righteous one, my servant, will justify many, make many right with God, as he will bear, again, we're talking about carrying, one carrying the sins or the iniquities of another, he will bear their iniquities. In verse 12, he poured himself out to death. He himself, and there's that word again in Hebrew, nasa, uh, to carry, to bear, to lift up and like carry a burden. Um, it's that same word, going back to Leviticus 16, it's the same word being used of the sacrificial goat that bore the sins, that carried out the sins from the camp on the Day of Atonement, Leviticus chapter 16. <clears throat> he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. When you get to the New Testament, before the ministry of Jesus even begins, we hear about another Jewish prophet, another Hebrew prophet, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, Yohanan Amadbil, John the Baptist uh, the, uh, calls Jesus the Lamb of God. There's that, again, that lamb, that sacrificial animal terminology now being applied to Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who, and the function is the same that we see in Leviticus 16 or that we see in Isaiah 63 or all throughout the Hebrew Bible, the sacrificial Lamb of God who takes away, who carries away, who nasa, who nasas the sin of the world. John, uh, Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 29. Uh, there's another place in, I think it's verse 35, where John says yet again, behold the Lamb of God. So he says it two different times there in that first chapter of the Gospel of John. <clears throat> Jesus describes his own ministry as a ministry of giving his life. The Son of Man, a self-designation, Ben Adam, who did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for the many. 
the word, the many, that's usually harabim, that's the public, the, the, the public at large, basically the nation. And this word ransom is an interesting word because here uh, Matthew, or rather Jesus, is dipping into the same sacrificial system that Isaiah was uh, referring to. Isaiah picked up on that word nasa, he will carry the sins, the goat will carry the sins of the harabim, the public, the nation, out into the wilderness, into the desert. Here, this idea is also the, from the sacrificial system. If you have a, a donkey, a firstborn of a donkey, just as one example, donkeys can't be sacrificed like other firstborn animals because they are not acceptable animals in the sacrificial system as set up by Moses. So instead of that donkey giving up its life uh, on the altar of sacrifice, uh, an appropriate substitute is taken from the flocks or the herds. And that substitute then gives its life to ransom that uh, animal that cannot be sacrificed. This is also the case with human beings. God will not allow human sacrifice. So the firstborn in uh, Jewish worship and Jewish, um, the Jewish scriptures uh, cannot be sacrificed. Instead, a substitute, an animal that is a, an appropriate sacrificial animal is substituted for the human being and it becomes the pidion, the, the, the ransom, the, that thing that is put in place that redeems. Jesus says, he came to give his life as a pidion, as a ransom for the many, harabim. Uh, in the uh, New Testament, as we continue our thematic study of Jesus' death as a pidion, as a ransom, as a sacrifice uh, in our place, uh, we hear this from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. This is Paul the Apostle. Uh, he says, clean out the old leaven, that you might be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, I've put lamb there in brackets, because that's exactly the, the, the reference, Passover lamb. Christ, our Passover lamb, has also been sacrificed. Again, we're seeing this connectedness, the sacrificial system take something, taking the place of someone or something else and bearing that, uh, the death that is to ensue. Christ, our Passover lamb, has also been sacrificed. So he says in verse eight, let us therefore celebrate the feast. One of the reasons why I and my family, grandchildren included, we celebrate Passover. Paul says, celebrate the feast. Why not? It's a July the 4th. It's representing freedom. God loves to bring his people into a place of freedom, and that's exactly what happens in Exodus 12, and that's exactly what Paul is inviting us to celebrate here with Christ, our Passover lamb. In the book of Ephesians, Paul continues. He says, walk in love just as Christ loved you, and then listen to the language, and gave himself up for us an offering, a sacrifice to God as a um, reach nicholach in Hebrew. It's difficult because of all the ch, but it is what it is. As a fragrant aroma that uh, sometimes in other translations, that sweet smelling savor or a sweet smelling sacrifice. God, God gave Jesus up as a sacrifice. Jesus gave himself up, Here's, this text is saying. Look at it. He gave himself up. This is voluntary. No one took his life away. He laid it down of his own accord, according to Jesus when he's talking to Pilate. Um, an offering, a sacrifice, this fragrant aroma. I'm going to talk to you about this for just a second because it's going to come into clear focus applied to us at the very end of our time, our study today, this fragrant aroma. The first time that this phrase ever shows up is with Noah's sacrifice after the flood. 
It's that first time that you uh, hear a real clear sacrifice described in the Hebrew Bible. And Noah's sacrifice is described as a reach nichoach, a fragrant aroma, a sweet smelling savor. Everywhere then that you find that phrase, those two words, reach and nichoach, showing up together, it's always in a sacrificial context. Hold on to that, put a bookmark there, because it's going to come back into play when we discuss 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and our lives lived out, poured out to God in sacrifice. Uh, in uh, uh, Hebrew, the book of Hebrews, we hear that now, once at the cons consummation of the ages, at the end of, of the ages, he has, Jesus has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 27 continues, and inasmuch as it's appointed for men to die once, and after that comes the judgment, verse 28, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of the many, remember that passage in uh, Isaiah chapter 53, where it talks about bearing the sins, the transgressions, the iniquities of many. That's the language that is being borrowed from the Hebrew Bible by this author of the book of Hebrews, where Jesus offers himself once for all to bear the sins of the public or the nation or the people, the harabim. Continuing with the book of Hebrews, he, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, then sat down, exalted, sat down at the right hand of God. Hebrews chapter 10. He, the book of 1 Peter, the apostle Peter writes, you were not redeemed with, notice that language, redemption, pidion, um, that, that is taken straight out of the law of Moses and the sacrificial system that God instituted for the people of Israel. You were not redeemed uh, with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers. Listen to verse 9 now. But with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, We'll hear about this when we do our uh, section number two about the law of Moses. Here we're hearing about the word tamim. It, it, it's a technical term that is used to describe a sacrifice that is appropriate, a sacrifice specially chosen, protected, guarded, and then chosen and put in place a, as a part of God's plan to that we give our best that the sacrifice that is put on God's altar is without blemish, is perfect. Um, there is no, in Hebrew, the word moom. There is no moom, no blemish, not even a split on an ear where maybe another animal in a fight has nipped at the ear uh, of a sacrificial animal. Totally unblemished, completely spotless, the blood of Christ. Now listen to verse 20, because he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. In other words, this plan was put in place before God ever created anything that we see in our physical world. This plan, a sacrificial system, a spotless lamb, a perfect uh, sacrifice on uh, the cross for on behalf of harabim, the many, the public all of us. In the book of Revelation, the last book in the New Testament, we find this. And by the way, this is just a short selection. If you go to some software, Bible software online, and you search the word lamb in the book of Revelation, you will find that this shows up from beginning to end consistently constantly in the book of Revelation, there is this lamb that is vulnerable, that is young, that is perfect, that is sacrificed, that experiences a death, and yet 
this lamb is victorious over death and victorious in uh, the way that he deals with the rest of mankind and the rest of human history. So watch just a few examples as we look at what John, the revelator, says about this vision that he sees of the lamb. I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb that was standing as if slain. Notice the lamb slain. All of this sacrificial language coming straight out of the Torah, uh, Torah, Torah Moshe. So in uh, the book of Revelation chapter 5, we get that lamb standing as if slain. And then uh, later in the book of Revelation chapter 5, we are uh, all before the throne of God in heaven, in our heavenly estate, and we're worshiping. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. There is this worship of this lamb that was willing to voluntarily give its life, lay its life down on behalf of Harabim, the public, everyone. In Revelation 7, they have washed their robes and made them, listen to, to the, um, how, how strange the language is here. It's to grab our attention made their robes white in the blood of the lamb. What a contrast, white by blood. They have made their robes white in the blood of the lamb. And then the book of Revelation is concluding, describing the marriage supper of the lamb. Instead of being now the main course, the lamb is the host. The marriage supper of the lamb with his bride the people of God, which is, by the way, a theme in the Hebrew Bible as well, the, the people of God as God's bride. Now, let's take a look at an, another section, the law of Moses. Now, why is that? Well, uh, Christians today seem to have adopted the attitude that the law of Moses is some kind of way um, not relevant, do doesn't speak, outdated, or whatever. I remember one time I was teaching in a church, and uh, I was teaching uh, on a, a lesson leading up to Passover and Easter, uh, Good Friday, the death of Jesus, and then Easter, the resurrection of Jesus. But I was teaching out of the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And I remember a gentleman in the back of the church objected, why are you teaching that here? This is a Christian church, and eventually got up and, and left the room. Um, the point is this, it's still in our Bible. If you open your Bible, the first book is Genesis, the second book is Exodus, and so on. The first five books of our Bible today as followers of Jesus is the Law of Moses. Um, it's still in there. When Jesus said, talked about the law of Moses in Matthew 5, he said that not a jot or a tittle, not a, a, not a, a yod or a kotz, not the smallest letter of the Aleph bet, and not even the smallest stroke of the pen from the law of Moses is going to pass away until everything is accomplished, and it's not. We hear in the, in the New Testament, the law of Moses is, code, is, is quoted constantly. And so there's every reason for us to embrace, this is God's word for us. This is relevant today. This is still a part of the Bible and still um, important for Christians to be aware of. And so even though we don't study it as maybe we should, it's still there and still available for us. I often hear this as well from well-meaning Christians. Well, since Jesus has fulfilled the law of Moses, the Christian is uh, the law, the, the Torah is no longer relevant to the modern Christian. I, I would beg to differ because again, we're hearing, we've already heard a number of passages from the New Testament that are specifically drawing from technical terms in the Torah regarding the sacrificial system, and I would, I, I would argue this. We can't understand Jesus if, and his death on the cross without the law. 
Why is that? Because um, if we don't understand what's going on in Torah, how are we going to get this most important death that was ever died? Was Jesus' death simply an accident, a glitch? Was it some kind of a historical mistake? Or maybe was it just the martyrdom of a really good man? If that's the case, then according to Paul, we are still dead in our sins and we're not right with God and there is no good news. If, this, if the death of Jesus was simply a martyrdom, then we have not received atonement. We have not received redemption We've not received pardon for our sins. The death of Jesus is the centerpiece of the Christian faith. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, I received what is of utmost importance and what I delivered to you, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That should put this front and center for every one of us. So let's dive in and take a look at what we have in the death of Jesus. According to the words of Isaiah, according to Jesus' words, according to what John the Baptist said, according to what we've heard from Paul and Peter and the writer of the book of Hebrews, the book, and all the way to the book of Revelation, Jesus' death was planned, it was purposeful, and it was that sacrifice that completed the sacrificial system and brought forgiveness, brought redemption, brought ransom into our lives. And God had already put that system in place in the Torah and the law of Moses. A friend of Israel and Israel recently raised this question to me and it was absolutely fascinating. It's so neat when we study the Bible in context it is so neat when we are sort of like in the laboratory, in the land of Israel, and, and these kinds of questions come up. Um, never had a, a person ask me this in church, but this comes up as a result of our work in Israel in con dealing with the Bible in context. This friend recently asked me if Jesus was the perfect, spotless, unblemished, Law, uh, uh, lamb of God, then how could that be when Jesus was jailed, he was slapped, he was um, pierced with a crown of thorns, he was um, scourged to the point that you could, uh, and according to um, the uh, Psalm 22, you could see all of his bones. How could Jesus be the perfect lamb of God and the perfect sacrifice when his uh, hands and feet were pierced uh, with the nails, and then there was a sword that was thrust through that eventually pierced his heart, and um, he was he was eventually and he was and he was already dead. How does that translate into a perfect sacrifice? And uh, the, as we begin to dig in to uh, carefully consider how these two realities could both be, be true, we found that the answer was in Scripture. And so I want, to, uh, want you to go with me to a serious consideration of uh, the law of Moses. In the sacrificial system, we are told in the book of Exodus, and it starts out as early as, this is before Mount Sinai, which doesn't happen until chapters 19 and 20 and, and forward, um, we're told as far back as preparation for the first Passover, which just recently happened. We're told in the book of Exodus, chapter 12, God's instructions for the, the ancient Israelites to prepare for this first experience of Passover. This is what the Word of God says. This is what the Law of Moses says. Each one of them are to take a lamb. So there you have selection from the flocks and herds. The beginning of sacrifice is for selection to take place. Take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, 
a lamb for each household. Your lamb, verse 5, is to be unblemished. There's that Hebrew word again, tamim. A tamim male. A uh, uh, zachar tamim. A, a year old. The whole assembly, verse 6, of the congregation of Israel is to kill it. So first selection and then uh, slaughter. Then verse 7, before there's ever even, even any um, consuming, any uh, roasting of the lamb or consuming of the lamb, put the blood on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses. There's something done applying the blood of the lamb. Then the lamb is to be roasted with fire. All of this, every component part, every step, is a part of this system of sacrifice of the Passover lamb. It is then to be roasted with fire. Uh, it is uh, there. You're also to uh, supposed to um, <clears throat> in the book of Exodus, chapter 29. Here's yet another example. We're going to deal with just a couple of the, a few of these. Uh, in preparing to consecrate Aaron and his sons as priests of God in the wilderness, they're supposed to bring a bull before the tent. You don't get a sacrifice unless you go out and you select an animal and then you bring that animal to an appropriate place of sacrifice. That animal's already been chosen. Its fate is already sealed. But these are pieces, component parts of the sacrificial system. Bring the bull before the Ohel Moed, before the tent of meeting. And Aaron and his sons will lay their hands on. Now this is an act of consecrating, uh, uh, making holy, sacred, separating apart from all the other parts of the flocks and herds, this particular sacrificial animal. Lay their hands on the head of the bull. <clears throat> the flesh of the bull, verse 14, the flesh of the bull and its hide and its refuse, you shall burn with fire outside the camp. So we're hearing about there's the need to skin the animal. After the, the, the bull is, uh, is slaughtered and its blood is drained, there is the hide, there is the skinning of the bull. And then there is the quartering of the bull. You cut it up into its parts, which we'll hear about later. In verse 12, you shall take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar. That's consecrating the altar with your finger. And you shall pour out all the blood at the base of the altar. They are again applying the blood in the same way that we saw in Exodus chapter 12. In verse 17, it's you shall cut up the ram into its pieces. You shall wash its entrails and its legs and put them with its pieces and its head and then onto the altar and offer it all up, verse 18, in smoke. Uh, we're hearing about an, an, another sacrificial animal. Uh, this is still in the consecration of Aaron and his sons as priests. Offer up in smoke the whole ram on the altar. This is assumed that this is the case with the bull as well. Um, and now with the ram, altar, offer it on the altar. It is, listen to this language, it's a burnt offering to Yahweh. It is a soothing aroma. That's that reach nichoach that we heard about all the way back as far as Genesis chapter 9 with Noah. And we hear about it on a regular basis about an appropriately offered sacrifice. It's a soothing aroma. It's a sweet-smelling savor. It's a fragrant aroma to the Lord, an offering by fire. Keep that uh, bookmark there because it will be important to understand future passages that we see even in the New Testament. Now we hear, I, I'm going to give you one more example from the Law of Moses. Notice how detailed, notice how specific, and notice that there is a sequence. We saw it in uh, Exodus 12 with the Passover. 
We saw it in, in Exodus 29 with the sacrifices of the bull and the ram regarding the consecration of Aaron and his sons as the, the high priests of Israel. Now we're going to hear, it, hear about it in, uh, with respect to the whole nation. These, the sacrifice that we're going to hear about in Leviticus uh, it, it has to do with the entire people. Everybody's involved in this. Notice the beginning, verse 2. Speak to the sons of Israel. So it's not just Noah. It, it's not just um, the people who are living, leaving Egypt uh, in chapter 12 of Exodus. This is for all people, all of God's people. Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when any man of you brings an offering, there again, there's that language of you separate out from the rest of the flock and then you bring that animal to a special place where sacrifice is supposed to take place. When any man of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of animals from the herd or the flock. Again, there's that separation out. This one's special. We're leaving the other flocks and the other herd, herds. Verse 3, if his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer it a male, a zakhar, without defect, a zakhar tamim, a, a, a male that is spotless, perfect. Uh, the English uses the phrase without defect, a zakhar tamim, and he shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering. Again, an act of consecration separating this animal out as special and designated for sacrifice. Verse 5, continuing in Leviticus chapter 1, he shall slay the young bull before Yahweh. There's the killing of the animal. The, the death of the animal is only a part of a process of sacrifice. I hope that you're picking up on that because that's the point of commonality that we saw in Exodus 12, that we saw in Exodus 29, and now we're seeing it in uh, Leviticus chapter 1. He shall offer up the blood, uh, slay the young bull, offer up the blood, and sprinkle the blood. Now there's not just the, the killing of the sacrificial animal, but there's the applying of the blood in these, in, in these uh, special acts um, of the sacrificial system. Offer up the blood, sprinkle the blood around the altar. In verse 6, notice the language. Then he shall skin the burnt offering. So again, there is this, uh, the, uh, b before the offering is actually placed on the altar, there is the skinning of the sacrificial animal. Then there is the cutting the, up of the animal into its pieces. We talk about being drawn and quartered. That's exactly this kind of language right here. He shall cut it into its pieces. Verse 7, the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire on the altar. You know, there's a fire that has to be kindled. According to the law of Moses, the fire on the altar is never supposed to go out. It's supposed to be an eternal flame. But when it comes time for the offering of an animal, there is the placing of, the, uh, of, uh, of fresh wood on the altar and the stirring up of the coals and the kindling of a fire that will be appropriate for the sacrifice of this animal. Think Genesis chapter 22 and Isaac's question to Abraham, Father, here is the fire, here is the wood, but where is the sacrifice? These are all parts of this sacrifice of this specific animal. It's not a momentary event, it's a process. Remember that we're answering this question of why would, how could Jesus be a, the perfect lamb, but then he experiences all of this damage to his body? He shall skin the burnt offering, he shall cut it into its pieces, and the sons of Aaron shall put fire on the altar and shall arrange the wood on the fire. Think again, Genesis 22. Continuing in Leviticus chapter 1, maybe the first time or that you've read the book of Leviticus for a long time, I hope you're seeing its relevance to the current topic. In verse 8, then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall arrange the pieces, this is the pieces of the, the, the offering that was selected and that was brought 
and that was, had hands laid on it to consecrate it that was then uh, bled and then skinned and then drawn and quartered. He shall arrange the pieces, the head and the suet. That's a special technical term, both in English and in um, Hebrew of these, uh, uh, of these, um, uh, the pieces of fat that are connected to the internal organs of an animal. It's a technical term from the law of Moses, the suet over the wood, which is on the fire that is on the altar. Verse nine, it's entrails, however, and it's legs. He shall wash with water. Notice again, the, all of these independent steps of a process of sacrifice. It's, and wash its legs with water, and the priest will offer it up in smoke on the altar for a burnt offering, an offering by fire, and then again, you get that language, it is a reach nichoach. It is a pleasing sacrifice to the Lord. Now I want to look at us. Look at the people of God. Is there application to our lives as well? Um, of course, Jesus has gone through a, a process of sacrifice. He was that perfect lamb of God that was, that, that was consecrated. But in order to be the sacrifice, you've got to go through this process. The process in the law of Moses that we just saw, the process, the historical process that happened to Jesus. Absolutely. You get the selection. You get the consecration. You get, in Jesus' life, the arrest. You get the, Jesus is slapped, his beard is pulled out, he is scourged, he is taken to the, this final place of sacrifice, and then he is pinned to the cross, and he is pierced for our transgressions, exactly like uh, the prophet Isaiah spoke. Throughout the New Testament, we get this kind of language applied to Jesus from Isaiah, from uh, the law of Moses in the sacrificial system, and now it's applied to us. Jesus first tells us, if we're going to gain our life, we have to lose our life for his sake. We're told by Jesus, if you don't carry your own cross and come after him, then we can't be his follower. In the gospel of John, the last gospel, we're told that Jesus gives us a commandment that we love one another just as he's loved us. In verse 13, we're told, greater love has no man than this, than that he lay down his life for his friends. And he's not talking about himself there. If this is, passage has been mis misinterpreted so often that we've sort of taken it on. Notice the connection between verse 12 and verse 13. Here he's talking about us. He's talking about you and he's talking about me. Greater love has no person than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And he's talking about our sacrifice on behalf of our friends, John 15. J Paul talked about this in Romans 15. I've written this very boldly to you. He's referring to himself because of the grace given me, God's supernatural empowerment of me, I've become a minister of Christ Jesus to the, to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God, that my offering of the Gentiles, notice the language there, sacrificial language, might become acceptable, sanctified by the Spirit. Paul talks about his own death. I'm being poured out as a drink offering. Those are the libations that the law of Moses describes upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. And there he's talking about us. Our service to God and our relationship with God is as a sacrifice. So Paul's now transitioning. Both he and we are sacrifices. Paul says in the book of Philippians, I've, if, but I've received everything in full, I, and I have plenty. I'm, ample, I'm amply supplied, having received from our friend Epaphroditus what you sent. This is an offering, a monetary, a money offering. 
What you scent is a fragrant aroma. Ah, there it is. We've heard it from the law of Moses, from Genesis 9 all the way through uh, the sacrificial system. What you scent is a, uh, is a reach nicholach. It's a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Have you ever thought of your monetary offerings as being a fragrant aroma, a sweet-smelling savor offered up to God that is a pleasing sacrifice? Paul says in Colossians, I rejoice in my suffering. His sacrifice, his life served under the, in, given in the service of God. My suffering for your sake and in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, his church. And listen to this language, filling up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions. I don't even know what to do with that exactly. I didn't think that there was anything lacking. Maybe Paul is a little tongue in cheek. Maybe it's a, a, a little bit of rhetoric that he's using here, but he's saying he's adding some kind of way to the sacrifice of Jesus. At, at least we can say of this, that when we live the cross life, the sacrificial life, we're participating with and, and joining in with that kind of life lived that Jesus lived. Paul says in 2 Timothy, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. There it is again, sacrificial language. Paul is applying to himself. The time of my departure, and there he's talking about his own death, as being a, that, that final ultimate sacrifice where he gives himself wholly to God. Let's turn now to a, consi a consideration of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Here Paul's writing to the Romans and uh, the, the church of, uh, of Jesus in Rome, and he s says this to them as an encouragement, as a challenge. I, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, present is like presenting an offering, so that's sacrificial language. Present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. There, obviously, we're in the world of sacrifice, um, and acceptable to God, and you've seen that word already, acceptable, or tamim, or unblemished, that which is um, uh, a, a sweet-smelling savor to God, a fragrant aroma. So all of this language that Paul is using, present your bodies, holy sacrifice, and then that word acceptable, we are within the world of uh, the language of sacrifice. Uh, here Paul is encouraging us to see a life lived in service to God, um, in devotion to submission to the master, as a uh, life of sacrifice, a living sacrifice. One might ask themselves at that point, though, uh, yes, but it seems like that I take one step forward and two steps backward in my walk with God, in my relationship with Him, in my being changed into His likeness. And this is exactly where we're headed in this study. We noticed all the way back with Jesus that Jesus' sacrifice was a process. It was incremental. Uh, there was arrest, and then there was uh, trials, and there was imprisonment, and there was uh, physical abuse, like uh, slapping and the pulling out of the beard. We saw that there was also this, the stage of of scourging, Roman scourging. And then there was the actual crucifixion itself where the hands and the feet were pierced. And then finally the side was even pierced. Uh, think back to the question that my Israeli friend posed that I introduced at the beginning of this study. How can Jesus have been a perfect sacrifice when he endured all of these uh, physical blemishes leading up to his final death. And this is the very point, and this is the point that I want you to consider when dealing with Romans chapter 12, is that sacrifice is not a moment in time. It's not a, a, a punctiliar action, meaning 
it's it, it isn't just uh, the actual death of the sacrificial animal or the placing of the sacrificial animal on the altar. Rather, it's all of that. It's preparation. It's the actual death. It is the it is dealing with the the body of the sacrificial victim in a certain way, and then it continues on even after the death of the animal with the application of the blood to certain body parts of individuals involved or to the horns of the altar, etc. It is a process. I want you to, from this point on, to understand is in, a, in a clearer way than maybe you ever have before, that when Paul is talking about presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice, that this is an ongoing activity. This is a lifestyle. This is a process. The same thing happened when we were looking at the sacrificial animals in the uh, sacrificial system of Moses, is that it's not a punctiliar action. It's not simply a moment in time, but there is preparation. There is then the presentation of the, uh, of the sacrificial animal. There is the death of the sacrificial animal, and then all of those steps that that go on from the pouring out of the blood at the base of the altar to the placing of blood on the horns of the altar to the dividing up of the animal the placing on the uh, on the altar of sacrifice the burning of the animal etc cetera, etc cetera. we are talking about a process not a specific instantaneous moment in time so also it is with your lifestyle in serving jesus is it's not a moment in time. It may have started at an altar, in a service, at a revival, or in your home, or whatever, as a moment when you committed yourself to serving uh, the mastery of Jesus. But it is no doubt about it. It is a process. It's a lifestyle. It is a continuum. It begins at the moment when you make your decision to follow Jesus fully, and it ends when we see him face to face, however that ends up happening. So please understand that this is what is connecting all the dots. It connects Jesus' sacrifice to the sacrifices of Moses to our own sacrifice. The key term, the operative term being process, being continuum, being a constant, daily, regular until we see him face to face, walk with God. Present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Paul continues in verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, what that which is good, and acceptable. There's again that language of the sacrificial system. What is pleasing to God, acceptable to God as an appropriate sacrifice, and what is perfect. Again, there's that Hebrew word tamim lying behind that, which means that it is an unblemished offering. So Romans chapter 12, I hope you never look at it quite the same again. Let's move to another passage that Paul brings in light of this sacrificial system that we have been drilling down on, been looking closely at this entire study. This text comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and here Paul says in verse 14, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us, demonstrates through us, the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. By this point, this is, this is really easy pickings right here. The sweet aroma, you automatically know that's a sacrificial term, comes straight out of the law law of Moses, out of Torah, and it is directly connected with this sacrificial system that we thought we could kind of skip over and move on to some of the cooler, maybe narrative sections in uh, the the Torah, or elsewhere in Scripture. The sweet aroma of the knowledge of him. This goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 9, and that first sacrifice that is described in detail, Noah sacrificing after the flood, and the smell of that offering rose up off of that altar into the nostrils of God, and it is described as a reach nichoach, 
that sweet smelling savor, that fragrant aroma, that pleasing aroma that was pleasing uh, to God. So what Paul is saying here is that Jesus is leading us successfully, and he is showing, demonstrating to the world through our lives of sacrifice, as we just talked about in Romans chapter 12, and we are becoming that sweet-smelling savor. Paul continues in verse 15, for we are a fragrance, again, technical term, straight out of the sacrificial system, we are a fragrance of Christ uh, to God uh, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So they're World's divided up into to two different uh, groups of people, those who are responsive to God and those who are unresponsive to God. Our lives being that sweet smelling savor, that sacrificial lifestyle is announcing to these people that reconciliation with God is possible, that a real relationship with God, a renewed relationship is possible because forgiveness is possible. That fragrant aroma spilling out off of that altar throughout the courts of the temple and then out into Jerusalem proper is announcing to every person within its reach that relationship with God is possible. God can truly forgive your sins and reconcile you to him through sacrifice, through that sacrifice. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. And then in verse 16, Paul talks about those same two groups again. To one, it is an aroma, sacrificial language, from death to death, but that's those who resist, those who are mutinous and rebellious, who refuse to respond to God um, in covenant faithfulness. And, and then the other group, and to, other, to the other group, an aroma from life to life. They're moving into that relationship with God, that reconciliation with God, that life of forgiveness, of being washed clean by the blood of the sacrifice. And this is our heritage. This is our lot. This is what we are called to as the people of God, to live a reconciled life, to live a life of awareness of what God has done with us in forgiving us and returning us in relationship to him. What a joyous uh, calling. What an amazing life and lifestyle we then are called to and have the opportunity to participate in that we are actually announcing to the world relationship and reconciliation and forgiveness uh, with, uh, uh, to God. Some people in uh, the Christian world, from time to time, you'll hear this, I will hear this, some people will make this comment, but I just feel so used. Let me put a different spin on that, maybe a little bit, a little bit different take. In light of what we have been studying with respect to Jesus' life of sacrifice, of the sacrificial system and the law of, of, of Moses, and how that uh, sacrificial, um, those principles, sacrificial principles, and even technical terms are um, appear in the life of Jesus, but also appear in the lives of those who choose to follow him, that we are called exactly to that kind of lifestyle. We should be on a regular basis feeling just so used. Um, what a glorious calling it is for our lives to not be self-centered, to not be self-absorbed, but to be poured out in service to God and to other people as priests of God, representing him to the world that we have been called to reach on his behalf. Being that sweet-smelling savor, as Paul says in uh, the uh, passage, 2 Corinthians, that fragrant aroma of Christ announcing reconciliation renewed relationship and forgiveness that uh, people experience when they come to God uh, confessing their sins and looking to him to wash them and cleanse them. It's appropriate that we pour ourselves out in service both to God and to others. And what a, what a glorious feeling it is to 
just feel so used. Um, I hope that maybe you'll make that a, uh, a, the po a point of um, consideration in the coming week. Maybe use that as a devotional thought. Return to that. Give that consideration. Study it out elsewhere in Scripture with uh, passages that follow this same theme. What a joy it is to be just so used. We have this final passage that I would like for you to, to join with me in considering in light of what we've already studied in this, um, in this passage uh, and the dealing with this text in Scripture. And that is, Hebrews 13 says, Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. I don't know if you've ever uh, considered the possibility of your praise to God, whether that is simply verbal praise, whether that is musical praise, whether it's uh, praise that is um, uh, offered up in um, the doing of good deeds toward those who are in need. But consider yourself a priest, as the scripture calls us, a kingdom of priests. And, and let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. And then the writer of Hebrews clarifies what he means exactly in this text. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name, a thankful heart, having an attitude of constant thanksgiving toward God, and then toward others. Look in verse 16, and do not neglect in doing good and sharing. This is directed toward other people. The sacrifice of praise directed toward God, this sacrifice of doing good and sharing is directed toward human beings created in his image who from time to time find themselves in need of a touch from us, of a hand up from us, just a little help from us to get them to the next stage. Do not neglect doing good and sharing because with such sacrifices, there it is again, the language of the sacrificial system, with such sacrifices, God is pleased. And there again, don't miss that last word, pleased, acceptable, pleasing aroma, acceptable sacrifice. All of this again is sacrificial language torn straight from the pages of the law of Moses, applied to the life of Jesus, and now that sa those same principles are being applied to our lives as his followers as well. Well, I want to thank you guys for joining yet again in gathering around this rich banquet table that is replete with the goodness of God coming out of his word. I'm blessed to have had the opportunity to, uh, to break the bread of life for you and with you, and uh, just want to encourage you to um, place, put these uh, um, principles into uh, practice in your own life. Let your light so shine that people see that sacrificial attitude and lifestyle in you, and serve as God's priests in this coming week and in the coming months and years. God bless you richly. Thank you for joining here in this study. Thanks for considering joining us in, in study on site in the land of Israel at some point in the future. Have a wonderful day in him.